Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. I can't believe my life has become hell in just four years. Four years ago, my wife went to work at Gilbert Endeavors. Our children were teenagers and Sarah couldn't wait to get out of the house. At the time, entry-level secretarial work seemed ideal. My name is Skip Trexler, my real name is Austin, but I've always been called Skip. I was what people would call wiry, of average height, and weighed less than 140 pounds. When I graduated from high school, I was not interested in any sports, especially competitive ones. The closest I came to anything sporting was long-range shooting. Throughout high school and college, I spent most of my non-academic time either shooting or reloading. After eight years, I was able to consistently hit a two-inch target at 100 yards. My favorite gun was the Marlin 336C for the caliber cartridge .219. This cartridge has been out of production for many years, but I have made my own from. 30 to 30 shells with the neck facing down. Success in something like this gave me a sense of pride and achievement that I desperately needed. Two important things happened while I was in college. I met my wife Sarah and my future business partner Chuck Fuller. Besides being a little boring, I got a degree in geology, got married, and started a small surveying business with Chuck. Life was good. Chuck and I never worked for anyone after college. We each invested $2,500 and started our own small surveying company focusing on small jobs and large volumes of real estate sales. We didn't make a lot of money, but we felt comfortable and happy. Chuck married a local girl three months after Sarah and I did. My family had a hut that we called a bungalow in Shill County on 160 acres where we held all our family gatherings. When I was younger, the Fullers had an actual cabin on 640 acres in Potter County. Chuck and his family hunted there but did not use it for anything else. That's all you need to know for now. As I said, my life started going to hell about four years ago. Gilbert Endeavors designed and manufactured trainers and its headquarters were local. They had manufacturing plants and distribution centers throughout the country. My wife Sarah started working there when our twin daughters Marcy and Mercy entered high school. At first, it seemed like a good idea, the hours were good, the pay was fair, and the location was convenient. The first year or so was perfect. GE had hired Terry Ulrich, a retired NFL quarterback, as a marketing manager and company spokesman. Unfortunately, my wife worked in the marketing department. For six months, we were inundated with stories about the magnificent Terry Ulrich. My wife and daughters were crazy about his greatness. Luckily, the adoration seemed to fade after about six months. Around the same time, Sarah started working overtime and Chuck and I, both growing up in the area, knew a lot of people who worked in Gilbert. It turned out to be not at all difficult to find out that Sarah and Terry Ulrich became a couple. While their relationship blossomed, our marriage deteriorated. As Sarah and I grew apart, so did my relationship with my daughters. I never told her about this. She began to travel more often on business and promotional trips. I became a non-entity. Usually, but not always, she invited me to accompany her to parties and gatherings where I was ignored for the rest of the evening. Sex was out of the question. How can a person endure such a life? Until Sarah started working, our family life was normal. We went with the whole family on weekends and vacations at least once a year. The girls took ballet lessons and played football. Sarah was active in the PTA and scouts. Every week we had a pizza night. The only thing the girls didn't like was spending time in the bungalow. All this was in the past, now all this has disappeared. Over the past few years, Sarah's number of conference retreats and meetings gradually increased. Lately, on several longer trips, she's taken the girls with her. I was never invited or even asked if I wanted to go. I often overheard the girls telling their friends about what a great time they had. They never said anything when they knew I was within earshot. Terry Ulrich was never mentioned, although I knew he was on every walk. At Gilbert's New Year's party, everything fell into place. It was hard for Sarah not to invite me, but I didn't want to go. The humiliation of having to live with infidelity alone was bad enough. I was afraid that I would not be able to control myself if the situation got out of control. I was right. All the girls were dressed to the nines. Marcy and Mercy were excited because it was their first adult party. I didn't have a tuxedo, so I just put on the best suit I had. When we arrived, there were several hundred people milling around. Skip Trexler, glad to see what you came up with. Thank you for bringing your wife and beautiful daughters to our little gathering. Terry Ulrich seemed to smile at the grimace on my face as he squeezed my hand. 
He finally let me go and I noticed Sarah smirking. The girls looked at me with disgust and quickly left. It was the start of a bad evening. I drank one glass of beer and hid in a corner, trying not to embarrass my wife and daughters even more. I didn't say or do anything, and yet I successfully ruined the start of their evening. Terry Ulrich was a big guy, really big. He was at least a foot taller than me and weighed 100 pounds more, all muscle. He was the embodiment of a happy man and a platform. My daughters crowded around the room, but my wife spent almost the entire evening next to him. She held his hand lightly most of the time. Several people at lower levels made feeble attempts to engage in conversation with me. Several mid- and senior-level managers noticed me and smirked or made sly remarks to their comrades that I felt were related to my cuckold status. I didn't hear any words, but it was clear what was happening. My beer was replaced with a simple ginger ale, which I sipped slowly. I was usually pretty well in control of myself and prided myself on never losing my composure. Many people started dancing and I noticed the girls were having a good time and so was my wife with Ulrich, of course. In the last three hours, neither she nor the girls have spoken to me once. A small group of men and women were chatting off to the side of the dance floor when one of the guys pointed at Sarah and Ulrich. They looked in my direction, started laughing, and quickly looked away when they saw me looking at them. A few minutes later, they were still giggling. That was the end of my evening. I put the glass down and headed towards the door. I noticed that Ulrich had his hands on my wife's ass and she was caressing the back of his head. Before I knew it, she was pulling his head down and giving him a big sloppy kiss right in the middle of the dance floor. It took me less than five seconds to cross the room, spin Ulrich around, and hit him as hard as I could with a roundhouse right. My arm hurt like hell and the next thing I knew was waking up in the back of an ambulance. It was only a few minutes drive to the emergency hospital and I noticed that I was the only one in the ambulance. I remember being wheeled into the emergency room. The next thing I remember is waking up in some kind of recovery zone. Half an hour later, I was visited by a doctor who gave me the latest news on my condition. Besides the broken arm, I had three broken ribs, a broken nose, three knocked out teeth, and two loose ones. My jaw was clamped with wire and my right kidney was bruised. Ulrich finished it off with a good blow to the testicles, causing several blood vessels to be damaged. The doctor said I could be discharged in about four days, but I would have to spend at least two weeks in rehab. If I wanted, they could arrange for me to undergo rehabilitation at home. I chose the first option. It was already late afternoon when my wife and daughters finally appeared. Sarah looked annoyed and the girls looked bored. Nobody said anything. Since my jaw was tense, I was reluctant to start any conversation. I could talk, but I didn't want her to know it. Well, Skip, what can you say in your defense? I quickly assessed her attitude and decided that I did not need this conversation. Instead of trying to answer her, I just muttered and pointed at my jaw. We must have sat there for a good minute before she spoke again. I was embarrassed, Skip. The girls were so humiliated that we had to leave before the new year. The whole evening was ruined, and for what? I should have known what it would be like to take you out in public. I guarantee that nothing like this will happen again. She had no idea how right she was. I just sat and looked at her. I couldn't even manage a smile, so I didn't do anything. They lingered for several minutes. Since I didn't react, they eventually just got up to leave. Chuck showed up a couple of hours later. We chatted for a few minutes, yes, I could talk, and then he pulled out the local newspaper. I made it to the front page, local NFL hero defends wife and daughters from cruel father. The attached story is about how I attacked my wife while she was dancing at the annual Gilbert Endeavors New Year's Eve party. Terry Ulrich burst into the room and held me until they took me away. Not exactly as I remember, but it's a story people will believe. Chuck and I talked for a couple of hours and discussed several options. After he left, I refused dinner and asked for sleeping pills. I needed a good long rest. I spent most of the next day being checked, probed, and poked. All damage was discovered and appropriate measures were taken. Now all I could do was wait and heal. One of the hospital staff gave me a list of recommended rehab centers in the area. I chose one of them near Hamburg. Chuck showed up later that evening. I sold him my share of the company for $2,500. Of course, the handshake was the most important thing in the deal. I was still a co-owner but not on paper. All good things come in time. We laughed at the fact that one week in rehab cost $2,500. Sarah and the girls never saw me again in the hospital. They actually came back the day after I moved into rehab and I understand they were very annoyed that they weren't notified. 
They were very angry when they came to rehab and were denied access. It looks like I was able to specify who could and couldn't visit when I logged in. One of the orderly let me know that they were trying to meet with me. My ribs hurt like hell when I laughed. The worst part of my injuries was the dental work. Luckily, they had a dentist who could work on site for a certain fee. I decided to take advantage of this. The wound on the hand turned out to be not as serious as they initially thought. Although I had the opportunity to leave rehab a little earlier, I decided to stay for the full two weeks. Ten days later, I was able to breathe deeply again. It was nice. Sarah never tried to visit me again. The National CrossFit Show was held in Atlantic City on the second weekend of February. Sarah and the girls were in attendance along with Terry Ulrich and the GE marketing team. Chuck and several of our employees spent the weekend moving my clothes and belongings to a bungalow in Shill County. He made sure to take my marlin and all my supplies for reloading. Two days later, I was comfortable in my new home. That weekend, Chuck and his wife June came to visit. It looks like Sarah was just looking for me in the office. There had been no bank deposits into the joint account since the beginning of the year and Sarah wanted an explanation. Chuck spent half an hour trying to explain to her that not only did I no longer own part of the company, I didn't even work there. In desperation, she ran out threatening to meet with the lawyer. After a couple of weeks, I was functioning quite normally. I did therapy and exercises directed. Chuck left me with one of the company trucks and a credit card. I also took a large amount of cash with me in case I needed it. I left my phone with Chuck. The bungalow was cozy but only temporary. I walked a bit and started jogging leisurely. Terry Ulrich had a large house on Dewar Street just outside of town. It was a long winding road leading up Mount Penn. There weren't many houses there because it was difficult to build on the steep mountainside. Finding the house was not difficult and I was able to find some good secluded vantage points. Every morning I exercised and got in shape. After lunch, I practiced target shooting. I focused on inanimate targets. My Bushnell laser range finder said I needed to be accurate at 133 yards. I'll be ready when I can consistently remove the egg from that distance. I bought a lot of eggs and I bought a muffler. I spent my evenings planning, adjusting, and recharging. I started growing a beard. Chuck came to see me about once every two weeks. Sarah came into the office several times, still trying to find me. After two months, she gave up. Chuck always brought a few newspaper clippings with him. It turns out that my wife and daughters continued to enjoy the high life with their new benefactor. He must have been fully supportive by now because I didn't do anything strangely. Sarah and the girls were still living in our old house, which I didn't understand. It's time to move on. I started heading back into town early in the morning to get a good vantage point to watch Terry's house. He was a creature of habit. I never expected such a big guy to be a swimmer, but he did 50 laps every morning. Naturally, the pool was heated. That weekend, I went to Potter County. The move from a bungalow to a hut was very welcome. No electricity, no running water, no cell phone signal. The nearest Walmart was a 45-minute drive in Olean, New York. I didn't want to go in winter, so I stocked up on everything I needed for the next four months. At least if I forgot something or needed something, I could get it before the bad weather shut me out. Early Wednesday morning, I drove to the office and moved all my stuff from the truck into my Subaru Outback. I parked the company truck at a construction site at the base of the mountain and climbed up to my chosen vantage point. There were no other cars at this time in the morning. I set up a tripod. I had one round in the chamber and one in the tube and the next two at the ready. Twenty minutes later, Terry Ulrich went out for his morning swim. The first shot shattered his right ankle even with a muffler. It was very noisy this early. Two seconds later, his left knee exploded. I loaded the next two rounds and took out his left elbow. My final target was his right wrist, which I couldn't aim at due to his erratic movement, so I quickly gathered my weapon and left quietly. Ten minutes later, I left the construction site and returned to the office to the Subaru waiting for me. I did not return to the bungalow but went straight to Potter County. The first step was to clean the source so that I would have fresh water. Then I had to start collecting a good supply of firewood. Luckily, the cabin was watertight and well insulated. LED lights were much better and cheaper than the old carbon oil lamps that were out there. Soon, everything was completely under control and I started shooting again, this time at paper targets. I saw her for the first time in the middle of the second week, a tall, lanky woman dressed in jeans, a flannel shirt, and a vest. Although she was far away, I saw that she had a backpack or something like that on her back. She passed by on an old logging trail that ran along an open area that served as a shooting range. 
640 acres, and I still had no personal life. Of course, it was much more practical to build a hut next to the road where materials could be brought. One day when I had the opportunity, I took aim at her. A complex crossbow hung on her shoulder. I had no idea what she was doing with it, but I was interested. There was a small fire pit barbecue area on the stove, so I brought along an old galvanized coffee pot and some cookies. Yes, I baked some really good cookies. It seemed to me that I was setting some kind of trap. Three days later, my trap worked. I'm sorry, my name is Claire. I hope we can talk, she took me by surprise. I stuttered a little and motioned for her to sit down. Would you like some coffee? It was the best I could do. She nodded, smiled, and took the crossbow off her shoulder before sitting down. My name is Skip. I arrived here about two weeks ago. I've spotted you in this area a few times. I'm staying at a lodge about a mile from here. I try to go every day and usually end up here. I handed her one of my famous cookies. Will you stay here long? I'll stay here until the end of the summer and you at least four or five months. She seemed to like my cookies, but I had a feeling she would have preferred cream and sugar in her coffee. She didn't say anything, I just somehow caught it. Is this your property? No, this belongs to my friend who lets me use it. Are you hunting? No, not really. I used to shoot a little, but I haven't done anything for years. Right now, I'm just doing a little target shooting. I don't want to be annoying, but you won't mind if I use this shooting range for a little practice. I haven't found any suitable place where I could use my bow. She had an accent that I couldn't place, either English, Australian, or Scottish. I didn't want to ask. No, not at all. I think we could find something suitable for targeted support. Feel free to use it anytime. She ate the second cookie. I felt very good. I am just curious. I thought most people were using compound bows these days. You have a recurve bow and it looks new. Take my word for it, the recurve is better. She used simple arrows for target shooting but always carried with her four hunting arrows mounted on a bow. That evening, I drove down the road several miles and picked up three bales of hay. Thus began my summer with Claire. Claire came every day and returned to her house every evening. The lodge staff had a tracker on her cell phone, so they always knew where she was. It was the beginning of our second week when a strong summer squall hit us. We huddled on the porch of the cabin, laughing and making fun of her dilemma. Without saying anything, she took out her phone and called the lodge. She told them that due to the weather, she would not be able to return that evening and that she had found a comfortable place to stay for the night. I was both surprised and delighted. This is how my platonic relationship with Claire Charles turned into an intimate one. From that moment on, we alternated our sleeping places. Highlands Lodge was completely out of place in Potter County. It was luxurious and very expensive. Most of their guests were from overseas. Claire's family was from Cornwall. Highland had hot showers, plentiful food, and laundry services, which I took full advantage of. Outdoor sex is fun, but it's much more enjoyable when you have everything you need. We spent less and less time at the shooting range. A couple of weeks later, while Claire and I were busy having lunch, Chuck and June arrived. June seemed especially pleased that I had a companion and even more so when she realized it was a full-fledged relationship. We kept a low profile for the first few hours and then June and Claire went off to chat. After the tragic attack on Terry Ulrich, I became the first suspect. This turned out to be a much bigger problem for Terry than he expected. The press wanted to know why I was the main target of interest. The more they looked into it, the worse it became for Terry and my wife. Although the focus was on finding me, the press quickly turned to the relationship between Terry and my wife. Three weeks later, Terry Ulrich was no longer representing the Gilbert Endeavors. Police visited the Shill County bungalow and found it empty. They had no credit card leads, no phone calls, and no idea where I might be. They never asked Chuck about the cabin. Chuck mentioned that Sarah had come to the office several times, trying in vain to find out where I was. She seemed to be a little desperate as her source of money began to dry up. According to Chuck, it turns out that Terry has lost interest in her and blames her for his problems. I didn't have a plan for the next step. I couldn't go back and had no other options I wanted to explore. At the moment, I was drifting. As we reached the end of the year, I felt myself becoming complacent. I was happy and content with Claire, but I should have paid attention to my real life. It was a cool autumn day and I was alone in the hut. Something was wrong, but I couldn't figure out what it was. I had just heated up the wood stove and made coffee when the door suddenly swung open. Terry Ulrich was just as big and ugly as the last time I saw him. 
He stood in the open doorway with a wide smile on his face and an old police SWAT pistol in his right hand. He seemed to stand unsteadily and held his left arm at an odd angle as if he was trying to maintain his balance. We just stood and looked at each other. I expected some profound words of revenge, but nothing came. Coffee bastard. I spent over $10,000 to find you. No, I don't want any damn coffee. Well, what can I do for you? I know it was you, you sneaky little weasel. Your wife told me that you did a lot of target shooting. I hope there is 911 here because it will be needed. His face became swollen and red as he spoke and he seemed to be driving himself into some kind of rage. Suddenly, a shocked expression appeared on his face. He dropped the gun and fell to one knee. Terry Ulrich rolled over on the floor and howled at the top of his lungs. About 12 inches of a crossbow bolt protruded from his left buttock. The remaining six inches were buried deep and firmly. Claire just stood in the doorway and smiled. We were in almost all the way back to the highlands. I didn't take anything with me from the cabin. It took Claire about 15 minutes to load all her belongings into the rented Land Rover. We laughed the whole time like a couple of high school kids. We finally calmed down to a fairly normal state when we reached US 80. Breakfast was comforting and filling. I assume he already removed the bolt and went to the hospital? I don't think so. He should call 911. I shot him with one of the three-bladed hunting arrows. It needs to be cut out, she can't be pulled out. He will likely have to lie on his stomach on a gurney when he goes to the emergency room. This must be awkward. Well, Miss Claire, looks like we're in big trouble now and it's all your fault. She flicked a forkful of scrambled eggs and laughed. After breakfast, I called Chuck and Claire called someone else. I brought him up to speed and he seemed to find it quite funny. I told him we were going to Ocala, Florida where my grandparents lived. He chuckled a little because he knew I only said that to cover his ass. While I was on the phone, Claire came over and took my wallet out of my pocket. She returned to her seat and continued the conversation while I bought treats for our trip. I didn't know where we were going, but I felt like Claire had a plan. She didn't tell me anything, and I didn't ask. I was happy with my ignorance and trusted her. It was a long day, and we finally stopped at a wonderful bed and breakfast in the Wisconsin Valleys. We were exhausted from the road and just fell fast asleep. Breakfast was great, and four hours later, we were at the Dutch Walmart. Claire had her things, but I left with nothing. I had no idea what was on her mind and she seemed to have fun keeping me in the dark. I got a new wardrobe and Claire got a big bag of snacks. Ever since I was a boy, I dreamed of canoeing on the lake. Finally, I managed to do it. Everything was arranged when we arrived. The outfitter was even going to take care of Claire's rental car. This gave me a clue that we probably wouldn't come back. It was intriguing and exciting. I couldn't wait to see what else she had in store for me. Before leaving, I made one last call to Chuck. Skip, what the hell did you do? All the news here is about Ulrich's latest failure. Even some of the national services have picked up. Damn it, Chuck, I have no idea what you're talking about. I heard June laughing in the background. Well, his media image is falling like a lead balloon. He can't seem to do anything right. Nothing like this could have happened to a nicer guy. I always wanted to say this. By the way, Skip, divorce is a good move. Sarah didn't expect this and it really hurt her. I don't know how you did it, but it seems to work. She has no idea what to do and she has no money. Chuck, trust me, I am not kidding. I have no idea what you're talking about. I never even went to a lawyer. Are you sure about the divorce? Yeah, she was waving it in my face and ranting about it just this morning. Well, it was nice to get some good news for a change. By the way, can you stop by the cottage and ask someone to pick up my things and car? No problem. Where are you now? Moss Bluff, Florida. I'm looking for a trailer to rent. Claire stood on the dock and waved to me. The canoe was loaded to the gills. I thanked my parents for making me go to Boy Scout camp when I was younger. At least in the canoe, I didn't feel like a complete idiot. We spent the next six days surfing the lakes. Every night we had a new camp. Claire knew where she was going and used her cell phone GPS to get there. I was with her and enjoyed the trip. The best part of the trip was that we enjoyed sex under the stars. The next day at noon, our adventure continued. A man met us at a small pier on a remote road. He and Claire hugged and spoke in French. About half an hour later, he gave Claire the keys to the truck along with a large envelope. We pulled our things out of the canoe and headed down the road. I looked out the back window and saw him push off from the dock. I was driving and Claire started rummaging through the envelope. I think I better get used to calling you Clinton. 
Of course, I gave her a strange look. She giggled and handed me a Kennedy driver's license with my photo on it. The name on the driver's license was Clinton Barfield. You're joking, aren't you? No, you are now Clinton Barfield and you have a new Canadian passport. She waved proudly in front of my face. Are we in Canada? Of course, silly. For days later, we landed in New K. Two hours later, we were at Claire's family home near St. Austell. It's like I was born here. I felt comfortable and satisfied. I was very worried about meeting Claire's family. The mansion was huge. Her father asked me to join him in his office. There was an elegant walnut gun cabinet against the far wall. I watched with interest as he reached inside and pulled out a rifle. He handed it to me and smiled. It was my Marlin 336S with a chamber in it. I realized that I was home. I never saw or heard from Sarah or the girls again. Chuck and June received strange Christmas cards every year from Mr. and Mrs. Clinton Barfield. They had no idea. This year, the card will feature a photo of us with our three children. I'm sure he'll figure it out. Was there ever really a Terry Ulrich? Dear viewers, thank you for staying with us and supporting our channel. See you again.